Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having the energy to come for, uh, to a talk uh, late afternoon. My name is Yoav Shoam, and uh, I will speak about uh, it's a little bit of a meta talk about AI and how I see it. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, uh, so let's see how much of that we can uh, cover. Um, the, um, the starting point is um, the success of AI, and I won't in insult your intelligence by telling you about self-driving cars or AlphaGo or the many, many applications of AI uh, in many areas. Um, it's worth, though, looking at quantifying it uh, a little bit. So there's something called the AI index, which I chair. Uh, that's the only thing I still do uh, in connection with uh, Stanford. I was a Stanford professor for uh, many years, and uh, uh, in addition to starting a few companies. Uh, but uh, the only thing I still do at Stanford is, is this. And uh, you, you can go and, and look at, at it yourself. But for example, you'll see uh, that uh, the famous ImageNet, that in, uh, in image recognition, uh, uh, computers have been doing very well, surpassing uh, human performance, at least on this data set. Um, uh, not only doing it well, but doing it quickly. Similarly, in language squad, uh, as perhaps some of you know, is, was, still is maybe, a leading data set and task in question answering out of Stanford. And, um, and uh, the first version of Squad, uh, within uh, a year, uh, people, um, well, it says really a year, uh, computers caught up and uh, exhibited human level performance. Uh, many, many such data sets uh, that you'll see in the reports of the AI index where um, uh, computers uh, have done well, uh, sort of human level. Um, so, um, so AI is doing very well, uh, probably why you all are here. Um, and why? Uh, and this begins to uh, dig a little deeper and begin to introduce some questions. Uh, I think um, you, many of you are probably aware that the sh of the shift that happened. Back in the 80s, AI was dominated by symbolic methods. KR stands for knowledge representation, representing structured knowledge, creating inference ru rules of one kind or another, and, 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 and reaching conclusions based on those. Um, that, um, that didn't live up to the expectations, uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and it took the shift to uh, uh, neural nets and, in particular, statistics in general, uh, to get the kind of result we're seeing today. So, um, if you look at the results, you see that indeed it was the advent of neural methods that enabled many of the recent results and many that don't appear here. This is a sample. So what have we said so far? AI is doing great, and that was facilitated by the move from symbolic methods to statistics. Um, again, if you look at the AI index, uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't think peop many people realize that back in the 80s, AI was as popular as it is today. This is just, for example, the conferences. At the time, there were two major conferences, HKI and AAAI, and uh, they were oversubscribed, uh, standing room only, and that sort of thing. Uh, the numbers are similar, but of course, the content is different. So, AAAI and HKI are still substantial uh, conferences. I think the next HKI that's happening in Macau in, in August, uh, I think has over 2,000 registrants. So it's a large, large conference, but still, of course, NeurIPS and uh, ICML, the machine learning conferences, or CVPR, which is a vision conference but dominated by learning, um, have taken up the, uh, uh, so, or at least uh, taken the lead here. Um, so, I, I'm about to, uh, to, uh, to, to introduce a but, but I want, do want to emphasize that every, nothing I say should be interpreted as saying that AI successes haven't been real. They have been. But let's put it in context. 
Here's a sentence that uh, any five-year-old will understand. Danny hit me at school, so I hit him back, but the teacher only saw me hitting him, so she punished me. It's not fair. I encourage you to try it with your favorite uh, chatbot or your intelligent assistant and see what you get. There's no machine that can come close to making any sense of it. And think of it, how do we understand uh, the sentence? Uh, we know that there's a timeline. There are events in time. There are people, actors, they take action. Uh, there's relationship like a causal relation or purpose relation between actions. Uh, some people know certain things, some people don't, some people know that others don't, and so on. Um, here's another example. This is an old example from when I was a graduate student, I uh, remember it. Uh, this is James Allen and Ray Perot uh, from their paper, spoke about a very aspirational dialogue with a virtual travel agent. When the next train to Boston? And a very sensible answer. There's a train strike, but you can take the bus. The next bus leaves the central station at noon. Um, it's not that mysterious, right? Uh, but what does it take to answer this? Whoops, I didn't mean that. Um, you need to understand that the person has a certain goal to be in Boston. He has a plan, namely to take the train. That plan has certain preconditions. Uh, the person being rational believes the precondition hold. Uh, I, the system, happen to know he's wrong, so let me communicate that and disabuse him from that belief, and let me be helpful. Let me construct an alternative plan for the same goal. And so this all makes sense. There's no. There. Uh, last I saw this was about a year ago. There were about 20 ch travel bots out there, and um, they didn't do this. Um, uh, even when you go back to Squad, remember Squad is the question answering data set that was dominant until recently, the Stanford one, where human reach, uh, machines re uh, reach human level performance, right? Um, when you look at it a little more closely, it's very fragile. Um, so um, Percy Liang, also from Stanford and his student, uh, just tweaked it a little bit and added a distractor sentence at the end. Um, and uh, it turns out if you do that, you very often get the wrong answer from the same system that gave you the right answer, even though no human gets confused by it. And if you look at statistics, you see that the F score dropped from an average, this is not for the best program, but across all the pr programs that were available to run on the on data set, uh, from an average of 75% to half that, and even worse if you allow the sentence to be ungrammatical. So these systems are very fragile. What you've seen in the last year, year and a half, uh, is a bunch of data sets that begin to explore uh, and say that you know the models that have emerged that have done very well on the data sets, and we'll, I'll say a word about the models, but I'm referring to things like ELMO and BERT and GPT-2. Um, um, have they're surprisingly good on the one hand, but very vulnerable to things that don't fool any human. And so here are two uh, sets of data sets. Uh, well, actually, so the, on the left, there's, there's something called GLUE, which in some sense has replaced SQUAD for question answering or na in national language understanding, NLU in general. It's a collection of uh, several. It was nine in GLUE, and now it's, I forget what number, in SuperGLUE. Uh, that these days is being released. And um, I'll look at two of them uh, to give you a sense for them. And I have to give a shout out to the Allen Institute of AI, and I know that Oren gave a talk this morning. Uh, I think they've also been pushing the envelope uh, in an interesting way, and they've put out several data sets, and I'll, I'll, so let's go over them very briefly so you have a concrete feel for, uh, for things. Um, so one of them, this is from Glue and SuperGlue, called the Winograd Schema. So Terry Winograd was is a professor at Stanford for many years, a uh, natural language and an HCI person. And uh, he gave an example of why computers don't have common sense. You can read the first sentence. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, so it, and, and it hinges on what the word they refers to, the pronoun. And, uh, and answering, uh, dis disambiguating the pronoun here, uh, call for some 
common sense, that very loaded term, but knowledge about the world without which you couldn't uh, do it right. And then Hector Levesque uh, latched onto the idea, and a very well-known AI knowledge representation person from Toronto, um, and he created hundreds of those pairs. Uh, that's called the Winograd Schema uh, Challenge. Uh, if you look at state of the art here, uh, assist, uh, systems do terribly. Uh, you know, 70% on some unverified uh, run, 65 in a replicable way. Um, that's very poor comp compared to uh, human performance. Here's another one. This is called Word in Context. This is also, this is from Superglue. And just look at the first line. There's pairs of sentences uh, that have a word in common, bed in this case. And, it, and the question is very simple. Is this bed in the same sense or a different sense? You don't need to go to look at some uh, you know, word hierarchies, word net if you know it. No, just you look at it as a human, tell me same or different. And human annotator agreement here is quite high. And so fairly un amb ambiguous. Uh, state of the art, barely better than chance. And so, here are two more. These are both from Allen Institute. Uh, ProPara basically is a pr uh, uh, looks at understanding texts that describe processes. This is some photosynthesis-like process. I don't know much about it, but they crowdsource verbal descriptions and trace. Uh, the states along this process, and then uh, ask queries about at each state where is each ingredient or each uh, object, and humans do fairly well, and computers don't. <coughs> and finally, uh, something called drop. Um, it basically uh, demonstrates that systems uh, that are statistically in nature, deep learning, don't understand mathematics. So. S questions having to do with subtraction or comparison, which is bigger than which, or adding, all those things the uh, computers do poorly on, and, um, and that uh, is reflected in the uh, leaderboard. So all this is by way of saying is, yes, AI has done amazingly well on a class of problems that can view as statistical pattern recognition or pa pattern identification. But there are a bunch of things that we would call intelligence that computers are very far. This is a reconstruction of a, of a cartoon I saw in my childhood, and I, if anybody can find it, I'd be thankful. I forget where it was. But it, uh, it was a, a, person, a kid looking at the stars through a telescope but standing a little stool to get closer. That's the idea. I, I, uh, I, I think AI is amazing, but we're qualitatively much farther from understanding the general phenomenon called intelligence. Um, what's missing fundamentally in a word uh, is semantics. Uh, looking at some representations, textual, what have you, and have some notion of what this represents, the meaning of it. Um, why care about semantics? Um, even if you were uh, a neural net Nazi, or you thought that all one needs was neural nets, or some machine learning uh, procedure, you need features. Where do the features come from? Sometimes they're handed to you on a platter. Maybe you believe that all the features you need are the pixels, or the, um, uh, the letters in the text. Fine, then you have your features. Men, often the features are much more mysterious and subtle than that. And people will speak about feature engineering as a side task, but often the feature engineering is all the work, and often it's not features. And in fact, thinking about semantics as a, uh, an aid to machine learning is missing the point. The uh, features can be quite complex knowledge structures, speaking about the nature of time and causation and belief. Uh, you d we don't usually call that features. They're really knowledge structures. And they have very interesting properties. They, uh, <clears throat> first of all, you look at them, you understand what this means, and uh, even if somebody else wrote it, you understand what it means. Um, most importantly, they're compositional in nature. You can take two knowledge structures and compose them 
and get something sensible. Often, uh, you know, people speak about knowledge graphs. These are very simple kind of relations, binary relations between objects, but even that gives you a sense. You know, if block A is above block B and block B is above block C, then block A is above block C. Why? Because of transitivity. And, but that's a simple example of a com compositionality. And finally, we have algorithms that exploit the, uh, the, uh, these compositional knowledge structures. And so um, uh, I believe that semantics are, are critical. And the question is, where will you get them? Um, <coughs> in general, if you look at, uh, again, this historical nature, uh, knowledge presentation gave us semantics, but it wasn't accompanied by data. And now we flipped, and we have lots of data, but little semantics. And the question is, as I believe, you need to combine both. Where will you get that? Now, some believe that you'll get it from machine learning for free. Um, the, uh, the poster trial for this uh, uh, attitude uh, is, I would say, OpenAI, um, who believe that more compute power and a ton of data, intelligence will emerge. Um, the, the jury's out, but um, you know, it took evolution a long time to give us all these knowledge structures. And do we really believe that in some sub-evolutionary time uh, scale, we'll get addition and subtraction? We'll get notion of timeline, of causation? We'll, we'll have something that looks like beliefs and goals of agents? You know, maybe. I, I can't prove it otherwise. I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unlikely. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what's the alternative? And here I think the answer lies uh, right in front of our nose. <coughs> oh, I forgot uh, this, uh, this slide. That's important. If you look at current models uh, of, uh, of, na of language, uh, they really are extremely, in fact, surprisingly good at identifying naturally occurring sentences in a language. Uh, that's what initially ELMO and GPT, then GPT-2 and Long and, and BERT today, in some sense, is a defining uh, sort of architecture. Um, in a very clever way, manage to get the statistics of the language so you can predict well which, uh, which word is likely to appear in a part of the sentence that you mask. And if you go to the demo of GPT-2, you can construct uh, plausible-looking sentences after an initial sentence. Go to a website called talktotransformer.com. It's, it's quite addictive to play with it. But as you'll see, what you get is something that is, I think the, the, the quote from uh, the Z, uh, uh, Z, 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 ZDNet guy is, I think, uh, got it. You look at it and you say, wow, that's really cool. And you say, this is ridiculous. And you realize that, that Percy Liang is right. Uh, these models have no idea what they're talking about. They just talk very well. And um, our, our CTO likes to say that Bert is great at writing, not reading. So, um, so, so all in all, uh, I don't believe that the neural nets alone will give you what you want. Now, I first I should say uh, there's no going back. One of our advisors, a guy by the name of Dan Jarafsky, uh, professor from Stanford Linguistics, um, said there's no going back. He's right. In the neural, uh, you, you, you can't do without, but it, it, it's necessary, but not a sufficient condition. And here's, as I was saying, is that big question, is why, where we'll get the semantics, I think it's uh, knowledge representation. That's exactly what knowledge representation has been focusing on forever. Initially dominated AI, now it's not at all, but the nature of time, causation, belief, that's exactly what KR was fo uh, focused on. And so when we, we did the pivot, we left a lot of money on the table. I'm mixing metaphors. Um, and uh, the time is to uh, bring, bring it back into the conversation. Now, how to bring it back uh, is a different talk. Um, it's uh, different, it's long, and uh, it's also 
more preliminary, uh, but I do, I, I do want to, um, to say this. There's um, the algorithmic part, which I'll uh, speak about in a moment, but even before that, there's what I call the applied philosophy part. It's how, when you approach a problem, a domain, how to get the right data model that you can work with naturally, that you don't start fighting against and because it's not representing what you want, because the method, the algorithm you apply to it don't make sense. So having the right uh, model to work with is key. And this is part of what AI used to do. People would argue, you know, representing time and action, and there were competing models. So is time linear or branching? Uh, you know, a ton of, and it did sometimes uh, seem like, you know, how many angels can dance on a, on a pin. Uh, but there was a lot of thought given to these issues. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, even while I was still active as a professor at Stanford for the last probably 20 years, certainly 15, I'd, no student wanted to get close to KR, nor would I let them because they wouldn't get a job, not in industry and not in academia. I think now the pendulum is beginning to shift. I think that's a skill set that's critical if you want to move AI to the next step. So that's number one, the data model side of things. And then there's the algorithmics. There's something inherently a mismatch. You know, neural nets are really a gradient descent search, and you need a differential structure. Everything needs to be nice and smooth, and then you crunch the machinery and everything works fine. Whereas if you want to do temporal constraint propagation or integer, uh, integer, uh, integer programming or some discrete method, it doesn't look like that at all. And so to harm, how to harmonize the two is a really interesting question. It's not one right answer. There are a bunch of various approaches, uh, but like I said, uh, this isn't the talk and we're out of time. And so, a um, little bit like from Maslow's theorem, you know, I left it in the, uh, in the margins. But the difference is, yeah, he actually apparently did have the r one right answer, and here I think there are a bunch of answers and I understand them only partially. Uh, but uh, if uh, somebody here believes that they have a unique skill set to bring to bear, I'm happy to have a conversation about this uh, offline. And that's it. Thank you very much.